Welcome to Why I Left, a podcast that explores the great resignation. I'm your host, Brian Akar. Join me as I chronicle real stories from real people about the reasons they decided to leave their jobs during the pandemic and what has happened since. In today's episode, I chat with Wale Ayantoye. Wale is a fintech industry veteran with vast experience in the anti-money laundering space. He actually transitioned roles multiple times during the pandemic, so I really enjoyed hearing his perspective on the great resignation. In our time together, Wale discussed how advantageous the work environment is now for prospective employees and how he used that to his benefit to land in an area he's truly passionate about. Now, I especially appreciated his ability to use this time in our history as a teaching opportunity for the younger generation entering the workforce, as the future of work will look a lot different for them. So let's go check it out. All right, we're back. So our guest today is Wale Ayantoye. Wale is currently the director, seller verification and compliance investigations for Etsy with a real passion for supporting anti-money laundering efforts in African nations. He's got an exciting story to tell about leaving multiple roles during the pandemic and ultimately finding his sweet spot during this time. So welcome to the show, Wale. I appreciate you joining me today. Thank you for having me, Brian. So we'll get into the great resignation talk. Obviously, that is like the topic of the day. Uh, But before we do that, how about you tell us a little bit about your upbringing and where you currently call home? Oh, man, <laughs> that's a very deep question because uh, where I call home today, I'll say is Eastern Texas. Mm-hmm. I moved to the U.S. in 2016 uh, from Europe. My parents are Nigerians, born in the U.K. I spent a couple of my time growing up in Nigeria, but then schooled in Europe as well. So I started my career actually in Europe. So a huge part of my job is around building and scaling compliance programs in Scandinavia and the Baltic region. And after that, I've had the privilege of building compliance and scaling compliance program in every continent as of today. So when you think of Australia, Japan, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, UK, African countries like Tanzania, um, Zimbabwe, I've had the privilege of scaling compliance program in, in those aspects. A huge part of my job is to look at payment industry, payment hub platform, and explain to them where gap exists in their products and how to meet to get those gaps before they crystallize. It seems like very interesting work. And now, what, what are some of the things that you've been passionate about in the work you do? Funny enough, being a Nigerian, uh, that we only say one thing, it's you can never meet a Nigerian that is in the middle. It's either you meet a good Nigerian, <laughs> you meet a terrible Nigerian. Uh, so, and if you've, if you've ever come across the word where we say something like uh, the African prince letter, that is if you're about to get scammed, where you receive a letter from somebody and say, hey, uh, my name is XYZ. I'm a prince of Zamunda and uh, my my king left me a billion dollars in gold and I want you to invest <laughs> kind of thing. So <laughs> so for me, so for me, it's, 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 either, it's either you fall on one side or you fall on the other side, which the side I fall on is catching the bad guys pretty much. The, uh, and the question you just asked me is very funny because I had the privilege of speaking at the Global Financial Conference a year ago. And one of the questions the participant asked was, I've met a couple of Nigerians and many of them are known for scam. How come you on the other side? And I was like, well, somebody have to do it. So th- that is why I'm, I'm extremely passionate about what I do. I always say that uh, anti-money laundering investigation is not a job for me to call it because uh, it gave me an opportunity to represent Nigerians and Africans in a different light. I like that. And so describe what's worked well in some of the working environments that you've been a part of. Clearly, you've been all over this globe. So, <laughs> you know, you've had, you have vast experience. I would love to hear that. Uh, for me, I always say it. At, at this current stage in my career, work-life balance is very, very important. And, and it's because when, when I'm present on the job, I do the job, I give my 100%. When I'm off the job, I want to be able to relax. And part of the issues that I've encountered that have made me change job, a leave organization along the way is I don't want to find myself in a position where 
I take vacations and I feel guilty for taking those vacations. Like you're somewhere, you're somewhere in Jamaica trying to relax and you, you're feeling guilty because you're away from your laptop. You're feeling guilty because someone is like, oh my goodness, why did you take a week off? This company is going to burn down and you're absent. That's not my problem. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, need, you need to find a way to build structure that when I'm out of office, the work continues. Obviously, I, I want to make sure like my, my absence is felt, but at the same time, my absence shouldn't be the reason why everything should come, should come to a standstill. So it's, it's one of the reasons why I've changed job along the way. And for me, one of my strongest philosophy is that when people have life outside of work, their work comes to life. I like so, that. That's, that's, yeah. that, that's a, ooh, that's a good one. That's a good it's one. True. Say, it's say, true. say it again. Say it again. When, when people have life outside of work, their work comes to life. Because think about this with Brian. You, you're planning for a vacation probably next week. You're looking forward to it. You're excited. You, you're having two weeks to, to unwind, to shut down everything work-related, deadline-related, and, and all of that. And then after those two weeks, you are more than excited to come back. You're energized. You want to bring your A game. You want people to know like, hey, I'm back. But when you're away and you're still working, it's like you're never away. So for me, that's like my strongest philosophy, which is when, when people have life outside of work, that what comes to life. I like that. And that I'll, I'll full disclosure, that will be something that I take from here on out. So, uh, <laughs> so just giving you a heads up. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate it. So thank you already. Right. So now prior to this latest job opportunity that, that you started, you know, describe, you know, what the experience has been like in that anti-money laundering space. Like what's, What's kind of the workflow? What's 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 the activity like? Absolutely, like it, it's exciting. Firstly, if you're a balance of introvert and extrovert like me, I think you're gonna love it because a huge part of your job you don't have to talk to anybody. <laughs> okay, <laughs> a huge part of your job is following the numbers, like we always say, which I believe is a common saying. The job that I do is around understanding humans' activities on the back end for every cut swipe. Every cheap insert, every pin you enter, there is, there is a behavior to that on the back end. When people think of the fintech space, which financial technology space, people always ask the question, how sustainable is it? And I'm like, 15, 20 years ago, there was no Uber, there was no Lyft. Uh, growing up as a kid, as African parent, they always say, don't get in the car with a stranger. I do that every weekend when I'm going to the airport. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> um, right. They always say, uh, don't eat from strangers. Every new series that I go work related, I order from Uber Eats. Mm-hmm. Like, not trying to promote any, any kind of company on this podcast. But that's to let you know that the world we live in has changed. So it's the same thing when it comes to my job, when people ask how sustainable it is. I'm like, there are a couple of years ago, what is it, um, cash is king. But today, if you look at my wallet, the highest denomination you're gonna find is probably $20. And that is probably, if I'm checking out of an hotel, I wanna leave a tip. But usually, it's my card. And what that says to you is that when people come online, all of these payment platforms that we have as of today, we have what we call P2P, which is person to person. We have P2B, which is person to business. And then we have B2B, which is business to business. But this is not a compliance podcast, so I'm not going to deep dive into all of those sections. <laughs> but the entire essence of what I do is around how does transaction value, velocity, and patterns of users looks like. If your behavior doesn't match what you say you're coming to you do on the platform, then it automatically raises a red flag. And think about it like this, Brad. If you come onto a platform and you have a deposit on a, on a mobile app and um, you wake up tomorrow, your money is gone. You're going to be back. So the reason why you're able to sleep well at night, knowing that your money is safe in your wallet, is because myself and my team will do that job. So that will be the summary of what I do. Got it. Well, that, that, that drives it home for sure. And, and so now, so you were in this space, right? And in March of 2020, the world really comes to a halt, right? And so COVID happens here. So describe how the pandemic affected you. Well, before I go into my own experience, I have to acknowledge that we all had two different sides of the pandemic experience. Some people lost jobs, lost loved ones within this space. 
some of us had the opportunity of getting new jobs. So I'm conscious of people who have lost loved ones and lost job within that period. But um, focusing on my experience, for me personally, I've always enjoyed working from home. Anybody that knows me will tell you I hate going to the office. And, and it's because when I walk straight into the office, before I get to my desk or my workstation, this person want to talk to me, that person want to talk to me, tell me their issues. I'm already drained. By the time I get to my desk, I want to do my job. One hour is already gone, resolving this issue for this person, resolving this issue for another person. But with that being said, when the pandemic started, I had the opportunity of working fully remote. Um, so I work from home permanently and nothing really changes. I always tell people, like, when it comes to my job, all I need is a laptop and a good Wi-Fi. <laughs> and it doesn't really matter. I get to do my job, whatever it is. I used to live in St. Louis, Missouri uh, when the, when COVID started. And after that, I relocated to Houston, Texas. I relocated to Houston, Texas, where I currently call home. And after that, the job, the company I was working with as, as, as of that period, we had, a, we had a great run. It was a great relationship. But when COVID started, it made me put life and things into a different perspective. Because the main reason why I was staying in St. Louis, Missouri, was because of the job. And COVID came and um, unlocked so many things. So many, so many saying like, oh, if you relocate from where the main job is, your career is not going to grow. We can't promote you into a team lead. We can't promote you into a manager. We can't, let you, we can't allow you to lead a global program because you're away from the physical location. Or you hear things like, oh, if you relocate, that's the end of your career. Or if you relocate, we can't allow you to relocate pretty much. So when COVID started, all of that policy changed, as many of us are aware. And when I relocated, I realized that I can actually do my job from anywhere without having to have a physical presence. And with that being said, it just made me put life into perspective. And another thing it does for me was my job opened up. Before there are companies, before COVID, I was actually thinking of relocating to San Francisco just because I wanted better opportunity in my industry. And when it comes to fintech space, most of the opportunities is in San Francisco. So Silicon Valley. And I was thinking of relocating. But when COVID started, many companies initially that would never think of hiring somebody based out of Texas, somebody based out of St. Louis, Missouri, or in Louisiana, just because they think you have to have a physical presence in San Francisco or in New York, all of that changed. So it's automatically expand the talent pool. And when that expanded, I had an opportunity. That's great. So it sounds like you 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 learned you learned a lot during that time. In the job that you were working, kind of multiple jobs in, at that time, how did it start? How did the pandemic really start to affect the relationship with your job? Well, the truth is, you know, when it comes to anybody that works in fintech or in payment space, one thing is, is is a fact, which is the scope of your job increases and the money stays the same. And within that space, it makes me start reevaluating a lot of things. And I realized that. The talent that I have, the, the job that I do, the excellence that I bring to the table every day, that there are other companies out there that are willing to pay more. Got it. Did I change job because of money? Yeah, I did. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to admit it, and there's no, <laughs> there's no fault in that. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, did I change job because I know what I'm worth and what, what I'm able to bring to the table? Yes. A part of what, in, what increased my chances was before the pandemic. You're the one that's constantly chasing after recruiters. Mm. When pandemic started, that was a shift of power. Averagely in a week, and this is not about bragging or anything, averagely in a week, I receive about three job offers in my LinkedIn inbox. Mm. As I'm speaking to you right now, there is one sitting in there, my response to you is going to be no, I'm not interested. And, and that's to let you know that it, it has changed. Right. And even for me as a hiring manager, it's difficult, like you have to bring extra to the table in order to convince people to come work for you. Absolutely. Because there's a shift of power now. And, and yeah, so now, and you know, earlier we had talked about there were multiple roles that, that you had worked in during this time. So you were in your prior role for a little over four years, and then it looks like you transitioned in March of 21, and then you transitioned out of the other role that you moved into in January of 22 and, and, and started this new role in, in February. So ultimately, you know, I'd love for you to tell us about these transitions and, you know, why did you leave multiple jobs during the pandemic? A couple of things. First one, which I think I mentioned initially is around work-life balance. I don't mind, 
One thing about my industry is this. There is going to be a lot of firefighting. But if there is the right structure in place, your firefighting days are limited. You, you know that this is a temporary situation to a long-term solution. But when you're in an organization where they just enjoy that firefighting, and that is how it looks like it's going to be for the next... <laughs> like, you look at your future in the mirror, and it doesn't look good. Literally, that was one of the reasons. Because what it does is, my job, the main reason why I do what I do, and anybody in my industry, the reason why we do what we do is because we're able to predict. Our job is more around being proactive rather than being reactive. So when you're in an organization that enjoys more being reactive rather than being proactive, then that is a problem. Yeah, sounds stressful. Uh, it, it is stressful. And uh, my last job before this, I was managing a 38 countries program. Firstly, 38 countries is a lot. But like I said, I love what I do. And so imagine situations where I have to wake up at 3 a.m. to speak with the central, with the governor of Central Bank of, uh, of, of Tanzania. Wake up at 2 a.m. to speak with this, this, the, the governor of Central Bank of um, South Africa, Central Bank of Morocco, and all of that. I don't mind it, but these are not things I should be doing normally if I have structures and headcount and people well-trained in place. I should show up when when and where there is an extreme need. And if I have to show up, I don't mind doing it if it's temporarily because of if the organization is still growing, which is one of the pain of a startup, which is fine. But if you're speaking with management and you're asking like, what does five, four years looks like? And they're looking at you like, what do you think it looks like? <laughs> then, <laughs> then right there, it's like, okay, it seems like this relationship is not going to work for long. Right. Because right now, during this pandemic era, any employers that have you working for them is a privilege. Because believe you me, for every employee you have working with you, working for you, there are six, seven others employees trying to scout them currently on LinkedIn or other professional platform. So you better hold on to them. If not, they'll be gone. And so uh, for me, that was like one of the first reasons. <clears throat> The second reason was around you being overworked and being underpaid. Those days are gone. Like for me, like I said, I'm a Nigerian. And one thing about Nigerians, we're very, very blunt. Mm -hmm. So I am not <laughs> so I am not ashamed to state this on your podcast mm -hmm. that part of the reason why I left was because of money. Mm -hmm. That was a point where I looked at what I'm bringing to the table and what I, I look at what I'm bringing to the table every week mm -hmm. and I look at what I'm taking home every two weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, even though I am not a math genius, but I can tell the number is that it's not hiding up. Mm -hmm. and, and, and within that space, I literally have to be like, okay, listen, just like everyone else, like I said, I, I, moved, to, I moved to United States in 2016. I'm a citizen now and uh, I want to leave the American dream which is buy, buy a house and, and live the good life. And when my realtor is going to start looking at how much I bring home, they're not going to care about my fancy title. They're going to care more about my paycheck. And another, which is very, very sad. Another thing is that internally as an employee, if your salary is going to increase from that end of the year, after you've broken your back and all of that, you get 1% to 2% salary increase. But you know you can change a job and get a 100% salary increase. Many people are finding that out. So. I did that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like I, within within the space of two jobs, I tripled my salary, mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh my goodness! But guess what? Though the quality that I bring to the table stays the same. And, and let me ask you the the level of work that you're doing is is still the same. Is what it's I mean. the same. See, so that, that sounds like a win-win. Yeah, <laughs> He's the same. The quality of the job is the same. And the truth also is that, yes, obviously, the higher you go, the more most of your job is going to be around strategic thinking. Right. But I've been at the top for a while now. So for me, nothing really changes around strategic thinking, futuristic thinking. Nothing really changes. What really changes my paycheck? Right, and I promise you, I love what I'm taking over now. That's good. I mean, especially <laughs> especially in Houston, you know, I get all these those little ads on Instagram about you know buying these houses in Houston. So I'm sure. I mean, you can come visit. I have a five bedroom now in Houston, Texas. Hey, hey that's good. You got room. <laughs> 
so now, so then, you, so you leave these roles now, and 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 you, I think we were just talking a little bit about that impact. So, really, what has happened now since you left? Talk a little bit about that. Since I left, I had more of self discovery, self realization, which is that many managers are always going to make you feel like you're not good enough, so that they can keep you longer. They know you're good. They know you're exceptional. In fact, good is an understatement. They know you're good. They know you're exceptional. But acknowledging that you're exceptional is going to put them in a space where they will literally have to increase your salary more than anyone else. And they will literally have to think of new roles for you more than anyone else. They will literally have to change everything. It's like being a star player. They know you're the face of the franchise. So they know they literally have to build around you. So acknowledging that is not something a lot of managers love to do. For me, being a people manager is different. When you're great, you're great. I'm going to tell you. And I would love to work with you. And if you tell me you want to leave, like I always tell people that work with me, I always say, listen, if you tell me you're leaving, at the end of the day, for me, it's a business decision. And I understand. Because guess what? If you decide you're staying for me, when it's my time to leave, I'm not going to promise I'm going to stay for you. <laughs> so that, that is just it. But a couple of things that I realized uh, is that nothing is impossible. Another thing I realized is that you're more than enough. Another thing that I realized is that when you're at a place where you're not fully appreciated or where you're, where you're not fully compensated, I think that's the right word, when you're not fully compensated, there are other companies that are willing to break the banks for you. That's important. And, you know, in some of the, the research that's been coming out, you know, there are a variety of lists as, as to why people are leaving, right? But, you know, burnout is obviously top of the list. But one of the things that you often see is things around what you're mentioning, uh, development, right? Recognition. And recognition, yes, in the money sense, but also recognition in other areas about, you know, potentially skill level, uh, exposure to other opportunities. So I think you've touched on a few things that the research has pointed to as well. And so you, you talked a little bit about those learnings and, and kind of what you learned about yourself through this process, which, I, which is great. One aspect of the show that I would love for our guests to get across is really, you know, if there are other people, which I would imagine there are, uh, who may be in a similar experience to yours, but really don't know what to do next. What's the type of advice you would give to those listeners? That's a good one. Uh, my first one I'm always going to tell anybody is job search is not a sprint. It's a marathon. That's the first one. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. The second thing I'm going to tell anyone, which I've, within these spaces, I've had a chance of speaking with people, is you are more than enough. A lot of, the, re the reason why a lot of people don't actually end up actualizing what they should actualize, it comes down to confidence. I've been at this company for four years. I've been at this company for five years. This is the only place that I call home. If I leave, can I start over somewhere else? The fear of starting over. And for me, I don't have a problem. Like, and I think a huge part of that is because I've lived in so many countries. And every time you move to a new country, you're literally starting all over. Although I'm, I'm done moving now, though. But, <laughs> <laughs> but with that said, uh, if, if you can just eliminate that fear of this, this is the place. Uh, I think this place. Honestly speaking, Brian, I don't think there's a perfect job out there. Th there is no perfect job. But you have to sit down and understand what are the things that are most important to you. For me personally, the things that are important to me is work-life balance and a good paycheck. Outside of those two, nothing else because self-development, I invest in myself. Like I, I read, I, I go to conferences, I speak at global fraud conferences. And last year when I spoke at global fraud conference, I was the youngest speaker at, at that conference, over 110 other speakers globally. So it is not my job that got me, like it's not my company that recommended me. I got myself there. So I think the most important thing is around how bad do you really want these things? And how much of self-belief do you have? And even if nothing at all, if, if you have, every one of us, we've, all, we've gone through that phase of self-doubt. I've gone through it myself. When I'm thinking like, am I really, real story. When I was about to change job, at some point I was asking myself, because I, I just kept getting denied and denied. Company flying me out to Atlanta, flying me to San Francisco, New York. Final stage, meet with the CEOs, we discuss. This is what I can do for your company. And then next me like, oh, unfortunately, we're sorry, we're going with someone else. 
So it left me in a position I started thinking, am I really good enough? And I was going through that self-doubt. But thankfully, I had people in my corners that kept reminding me that, do you, do you know who you are? So I think it's very important when you're going through that phase of self-doubt, have people in your corner that can constantly remind you of your home greatness in case you forgot. Yeah, I, there, there's some really good gems in there. One, having that support system is key, right? And then something you mentioned earlier on was about that value alignment, right? So finding opportunities that align with your values, whatever those are, right? And being really, really self-aware enough and true to yourself about you know what it is that you want actually, that you actually need. So I appreciate you sharing that. Absolutely. Now, now in this next role, right? So now you're you're you've moved on to Etsy. So what what type of impact are you hoping to have in this next phase of your professional life? I'm at a place now where I'm li- like uh, just like my last job. I'm leading a global program. I think I'm at a stage where I have a lot to give, which is there's a stage you get to, into your career where you realize that it is more about giving and less receiving. So that is the stage I am right now. I, I have a lot to give in terms of support system, people growing their career within the organization and outside the organization, people channeling other gifts that they have outside the job itself. Like for me, outside of fraud, compliance, risk management, and all of that, I'm an author. Like I publish book on leadership. There are other things I, I, I speak at conferences and all of that that I do, which keeps me going. So like I said, I'm at a stage in my career where it's more about giving. The second thing that I plan to achieve at Etsy is, is around bringing more of who I am, which is all of the global experiences that I have in Africa, Australia, Japan, Europe, and the rest, uh, bring it down to Etsy Marketplace and help bring all of that knowledge and help push the platform to, to a whole new level. So those are the things that I'm actually looking to like accomplish. And in terms of environments, they, they've already created an environment where I can actually call home for myself. Like, so for me, it's like, okay, because this is where it is. I'm going to give you what I have, but you have to give me what you have as well. So if you're not going to let, if, if you're not going to let go of what you have, I'll pocket what I have. And for me, it goes beyond just the money. I want to make sure I earned every paycheck. So if I'm at a place where I feel like I'm not bringing value, I'm not contributing value to the direction in which we're going, I will go somewhere else where I feel like my value is needed. Right. No, I like that. And you know, you talked about giving back. When we spoke earlier, you admit, are you involved in any type of, uh, was it like a youth organization, giving back to the youth in, in that type of way? You had mentioned something about that. Could you expand a little bit on that? Yeah, uh, there's a couple of projects that, one of the projects that I'm currently working on with um, some of my friends, like I said, I have a very strong tie with, with Nigeria and Africa. There's a project working on, which is um, Classroom to Boardroom. Classroom to Boardroom is the idea of transitioning from college into the workspace environment. As a hiring manager and having the privilege of interviewing so many people across different ethnicity and countries and continents, one of the major gaps that I've seen is most of our school system doesn't really prepare people for what life looks like after college. So you interview somebody and they're just looking at, and the only thing they can say throughout the entire interview is, oh, I graduated the first class, I graduated cum laude. And I'm like, okay, I, I get it. What are the substance? So, and at, initially I was a little bit harsh, which I have to admit, but along the way I realized that maybe it's not these people's fault. Maybe if, if there is something, since I've recognized there's an issue, then I might as well just start resolving it. So that is where that comes in. Like it's, it's a mentorship program where myself and a couple of my friends try to help graduating students from colleges into transition and pretty much advice. And sometimes people reach out to me, I'm looking for a job within this space. If it's not within my space, fortunately for me over the years, I've built a network of people. So it's easy for me to say, okay, let me see what you have and um, let me reach out to someone in my network and see what they can come up with. All right. No, absolutely. I, I think that's really good. So I wanted you to, to talk a little bit about that. Well, look, Wale, this was, this, this was a great conversation. I loved hearing the story. Like I said, you dropped some gems that I'm going to take full transparency on this podcast, <laughs> right? Um, but it was really great to have you take some time and talk to us about your story. And so I'm excited to hear 
you know, how you're giving back. And I really hope we, we can stay connected. Right. And not, not, not only for the gyms, but, you know, maybe for that, that extra room in the house, I'll come down to, <laughs> down to Houston and, and, and visit with you and the family. So absolutely, man. You're, you're, you're more than welcome. I appreciate it. And so now look, before we get out of here, where, where can our listeners follow you? Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, which is by name Wale Ayatoye. I have my website, waleayatoye.com. I think it's just pretty much straightforward. And uh, my book is on Amazon, Wale Ayatoye. It, it's got a cover. And like I always tell people, uh, be your home brand ambassador. Mm-hmm. No, I like that. All right. Well, look, that's a wrap for today's episode. Again, I want to thank our guest, Wale Ayatoye, for joining us. And I'll be sure to share all of that information in the show notes so you can check him out. So hope everyone has a great week. And Wale, thank you again. And I'll see you all next time. Thank you. The great resignation, people leaving their jobs in droves. There's a lot of buzz happening in the job market of late. Now, did you or someone you know leave your job during the pandemic and want to share your story? We've been having some really good conversations in this space. So if you're interested, I'd love to have you join the program. If so, here's how you can do it. First, you can email us at hello at whyileft.co. That's hello at whyileft.co. Or visit us online at whyileft.co. That's whyileft.co. Look forward to having you join the conversation. Thanks again for listening to Why I Left. Be sure to join us next time for more stories from the Great Resignation. Visit us at www.whyileft.co. That's whyileft.co. And subscribe to the show on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. 